You're watching World Insight, coming up. A new platform on public health and outbreak control at the third CIIE. A big presence in this new space is farm giant Merck. A word with the company chairman and CEO, after this break. Pharmaceutical industry is collaborating in an unprecedented way. Standing in the heart of Shanghai, one could not help but be amazed by how this city of 23 million and China as a whole of 1.4 billion people has managed to ride the waves of COVID-19 and could run a gigantic event like CIIE today. Stefan Oshman, chairman of the executive board and CEO of Merck, one of the biggest pharmaceutical companies in the world, was also curious about that. In our conversation, he brings the latest update on the development of vaccines and the prospect of team worldwide, and of course, shares his vision about the industry he's in now. And I'm glad to be joined by Stefan Oshman, who is the chairman of the executive board and CEO of Merck. Mr. Oshman, what a pleasure. Thank you for having me. COVID-19 a big problem for every one of us. So what does that mean for pharmaceutical industry? I know you are not only responsible for the company Merck, which of course is a huge brand name in the industry, but also for the European uh, Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry as well. So from your perspective, how do you see the challenges and opportunities? Yeah, I, I used to serve as the chairman of FPA, the European Federation of Pharmaceutical Industry Associations. Um, uh, I, there is a successor right now, so I'm not in that uh, in that role anymore. But I'm very much in touch with policymakers, healthcare officials, the science community, the science community in Europe. We see that uh, COVID-19 is on the rise again in Europe. We've seen in Belgium, in several other European countries. Uh, the numbers rising. So the pharmaceutical industry is collaborating in an unprecedented way in finding solutions to this uh, to this crisis. Whether it's vaccines, whether it's antibodies, whether it's antivirals, immunological compounds, and we're also working a lot with uh, with diagnostics with diagnostics makers. So we we currently see through global collaborative efforts, uh, a, a, a wonderful spirit of, uh, working, of working together in the face of this crisis. Twelve vaccines already enter into the third phase trial. And also we know that five out of them could be coming from China. Of course, we do not know the final results. So from your expertise, when shall we expect some um, specific results of a third trial data uh, regarding all of these tests, third stage, and also uh, how can we expect about the timeline, Mr. Oshman? I'm sure that's the question on everybody. The, you, you presented the numbers uh, correctly. There are about 200 vaccine projects worldwide. Uh, to my knowledge, four of them are in phase three in China. There are several other there are several other projects worldwide. They're different and very novel technologies. There's technologies such as messenger RNA, very exciting technology, yeah. viral vector vaccine unit, etc. Um, we are expecting the first data out of these uh, phase three trials within the next couple of weeks. Mm. It is difficult to predict, and I don't want to become too technical, but you can imagine that uh, such trials must be valid statistically, so you have to have a certain, I would call, events in, uh, in, in such a trial, and nobody can predict this precisely, but we, we assume that we will see data very soon. If these data are positive, the manufacturers uh, of, uh, uh, of these, uh, these vaccines, the, 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 the people who are developing the vaccines, are in close contact with the regulatory bodies worldwide, and the regulatory bodies have also assumed a different type of uh, working style. So they're working uh, day and night to 
So we hope that we would have then a vaccine available soon. It needs to be scaled up. MAC plays a big role in supporting yeah. manufacturing of vaccines. We're supporting more than 50 vaccines, uh, vaccines projects. Mm -hmm. uh, we have been noticing certain signs, uh, for example, coming from WHO earlier, the efficacy was being described that needs to be at least 70% and above. And now it is uh, considered to be a 60%. That's already uh, quite uh, significant. Uh, so what does that mean, Mr. Oshman, that we are apparently lowering the bar for efficacy? Does it mean we have encountered enormous amount of challenge in terms of come up with the right vaccine at this moment? Yeah, when assessing any novel medical technology, it's always about a risk-benefit uh, okay. assessment. What is the benefit that such a technology brings to patients? And what is the risk that it brings? And nothing is risk-free, so regulators have to, uh, have to say no vaccine is 100% effective. Uh, you know, uh, humans are very different and some humans have different reactions uh, to vaccines. That's why we need to do such big phase three trials. So we need to prove that the vaccine works yes. and that it is safe uh, and well tolerated. Um, the, the goal of a vaccination program is re must be risk reduction. Mm. COVID-19 is a terrible disease but it, it creates a sort of what we call a lethality. That means a death rate of about 0.6% on average worldwide. Mm. So we need to be doing the right thing to manage that risk. And if we vaccinate high risk populations first and have a, an acceptable uh, percentage of, uh, of efficacy, we would reduce the risk significantly so that we could go back to a, what we would say, called normal life earlier. Mr. Oshman, uh, thank you for the rich information you provided earlier regarding team, but we have seen human beings encounter one after another tremendous challenge in terms of diseases. COVID-19 is only one of them. So how far are we, for example, scientific research from the real needs to combat all these diseases? Uh, I know you've been working on your uh, uh, scientific research side and, and on the priority of the company's research. Tell me more about that. Yeah, in our healthcare uh, business, we're focusing on two research areas. One is cancer or oncology with a strong focus on so-called immuno-oncology, i.e. using using our own immune system to fight cancer. And the other one is immunology. And immunology is a very, very important uh, field of research where we can make a lot more progress to, bene uh, to benefit uh, patients. We see exciting technology developments in this area. We've seen over the past couple of years that, for instance, certain cancer types that were almost uh, untreatable not so long ago can now be treated very, effect very effectively. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are excited to be part of the research community in this, uh, in this area. We have introduced uh, significant products in, the, uh, in this area in, in difficult to treat cancers, mm -hmm. uh, in certain rare cancers such as macular cell carcinoma or in bladder cancer. And, and, uh, and several other uh, several other areas. So uh, this is a field where the biopharmaceutical industry, together with academia and other partners, can really uh, achieve, is achieving a lot of uh, a lot of progress and can make a major contribution toward uh, toward health. On the other hand, Mr. Oshman, as uh, the chairman and the CEO of a global company, I'm sure you understand the complexity of geopolitics. Do you think they will hinder uh, further cooperation among parties uh, uh, to work in life science and medical science? Uh, we obviously, we, we're watching this like anybody else and we're concerned about certain, uh, about certain trends. And if you look at the COVID crisis right now, we cannot say it's them and we. It's we are in this together. We are a global community, and we must act as a global community. And I'm excited by all these 
collaborative efforts that I was mentioning uh, early on, whether it's through WHO, whether it's through the Gates Foundation, through other regional or global uh, global initiatives, and it, this we can tackle this only if we work uh, if we work together. I'm not an expert at, uh, at uh, geopolitics. I just hope that reason will prevail. Another thing I want to ask you is about the CIIE. Uh, your company has been very active in setting up showcases uh, within the exhibition. And how do you see the message uh, this year, CIIE? Uh, the exhibition area has been even expanded than last year. Uh, even though this is a very difficult year for everyone. And meanwhile, uh, global companies like yours have been working hard in order to uh, showcase the best that you have to the global audience, especially here in China. How do you make up the significance of this event? Well, you know, we've always had uh, a strong focus on China and a very strong team in China, and we've collaborated very closely with our team early in the COVID crisis. And we took a lot, many important lessons from our colleagues in China, and we're observing uh, that China is uh, managing this uh, situation in a, in a very decisive and very effective way. So we assume that the uh, economic and technology weight of China in the global community will increase, or is actually in, uh, increasing. So this is a very this is a very strong message. Secondly, we see that China has been really catching up in technology development and is leading in quite a few uh, in quite a few areas. If you look at the application of artificial intelligence in healthcare, mm -hmm. for instance, we see that uh, that China is clearly in the lead. China is uh, has uh, increased. Uh, uh, import has increased intellectual patent, uh, uh, intellectual property protection, which is very important uh, for our industry. China has improved the regulatory, the regulatory process for uh, for new drugs, so that is a much more favorable environment, and we are very happy. To be uh, to be involved in this, and CIIE is sort of uh, a, a, a prime example uh, of how these policies then translate uh, into uh, into reality. I, I would have loved to be there. I was trying very hard to come to China. Mm -hmm. It was obviously not possible mm -hmm. uh, this year, but I hope that I'll be back soon. Well, usually people have to go through the 14 days, uh, but I guess uh, for a global CEO like you, that will be uh, very much a big chunk of your time. There is going to be the COVAX. Uh, that is a platform, as you may know very well, Mr. Oshman, for uh, countries to come together and also bring the best uh, products and possibilities as a global common good. But uh, even after a vaccine comes into being, the workloads of manufacturing, distributing, and also injecting uh, could be extremely heavy as well. So what do you make of the prospect and one wave of challenge after another, it seems? Yeah, COVAX is a very important initiative. This is uh, the WHO uh, platform. We must make sure that we that we ramp up uh, manufacturing capacity early on, and that is happening. Uh, it's the it's WHO, it's individual governments, it's uh, like uh, institutions like BARDA in the United States. The Chinese mm -hmm. government is doing a lot. The EU, uh, the EU Commission. So Indeed. we see very good, we see very good progress on this. But we must be realistic. If we have a vaccine, it will take some time. Uh, to to scale up uh, to scale up the process, and then governments are also looking very deeply into logistics. You know, some of these uh, vaccines need to be stored at minus 70 degrees, so you have to have a, a very well functioning, a very well functioning cold chain, yeah. and that needs to go to down to the community uh, um, uh, vaccine uh, vaccine centers that are currently being uh, being set up. Mm -hmm. But uh, I see uh, uh, I'm. I'm Fairly optimistic that governments will make sh uh, that governments will be able to manage this task. Mm -hmm. uh, Covax is also about access to vaccines in low-income countries, and different mm -hmm. governments uh, uh, different com governments are contributing a lot 
a lot to that. Mm. On the other hand, uh, even with the COVAX goal totally achieved, it is only 20% of the world's population by the end of next year, 2021. Will that be enough uh, for us as a whole, I mean human being as a whole, be able to handle this pandemic uh, by the end of next year? Or the number has to be much higher, probably 60 and 70%, or we just don't know at this point, Mr. Oshman. Vaccines play an important role, and as I said early on, we will use a stepwise approach to this. So once we have a vaccine, we will first vaccinate high-risk populations. If the high-risk populations are better protected, that will reduce the impact of, uh, of this disease significantly. Mm. We also need to make progress on uh, neutralizing antibodies. There are many, many such projects, there are such projects in China, in India, in the United States, in Europe. And neutralizing antibodies could actually play an important role in protecting people. Uh, there are so many companies working on antiviral compounds right now. And many companies such as ours are also working on, uh, on molecules that could influence the immune response, very important in the treatment of, uh, of, uh, of COVID-19. So I'm cautiously optimistic that we will be, during the course of the next year, in a situation where we can bring down the risk of this disease uh, to, to an area where it's, where, where it's manageable. Very complicated. Uh uh, 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 information that we still do not know. So how uh, cautiously optimistic, as you use the word, uh, Mr. Oshman, can we be together with you? Yes, that's very true what you're saying. There's so many unknowns about this, uh, about this disease. Mm. Uh, we have gathered knowledge, so we know a lot more. There have been a few cases of people that got reinfected. Some of them people, some of these people actually then had a the worst progression of the uh, of the disease. There are effects such as uh, antibody detect dependent enhancement. That is uh, something that uh, uh, if you have immunology or if you develop antibodies against a certain virus, that the next inf uh, infection could actually be worse. So there are all sorts of question marks. Mm -hmm. We are watching very closely how the virus is mutating. So far, uh, the coronavirus is, is obviously like any other virus is mutating, but the pace in the important in the important areas uh, that are that define uh, immunity is less than, for instance, in in, in other viruses. Mm -hmm. So this will remain to be a challenge, and this virus will not go away, and we will continue to uh, we will continue to search, and uh, and it would be simply unprofessional to make any predictions because we simply don't know. Yeah. But I remain, as I said, I remain cautiously optimistic. Well, we are experiencing all these difficulties and unpredictabilities. We're also thinking about the future. Of course, working on the current best way to prepare for the future. But people have been thinking about when is going to be this great reset? And what does it take? And what would lead us uh, to uh, the uh, triumph, at least a temporary victory over the current uh, uh, difficult uh, stage of challenge we have. As a global CEO and chairman of the board, how do you see all these unpredictabilities and moving factors? How would you make your decisions on a constant basis? When I was younger, uh, and I think and you're I still young, sir, industry. because you have a lot of updated information <laughs> about everything. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> <laughs> now, when I, was, when I was truly a young man, uh, I was involved, for instance, in 10-year planning, 10-year strategic plans. And at that time, let's say in the 1980s, that was possible. Today, who can predict how the world is going to look? Uh, is going to look? We, we just don't know. Mm. So we need to work in scenarios. And to me, for me, the key is a highly capable and agile organization. So what we're focusing on is create the right culture in a, in, in a company so that you have technically competent people with the right values, the right, uh, the right work ethics, and agile minds. Mm. That they're on top of all these and of all these trends and can react very fast. And I must say that our people, especially our team in China, has proven that they are uh, that they are such people, and I'm very proud of them.
And that's all the time we have for this edition of World Inside in Shanghai. On behalf of my team here in Shanghai and in Beijing, thanks for watching, and I'll see you tomorrow.